Welcome to another episode of Acts of the Blood God, an independent RPG podcast. I'm your host, Cap Bailey. Joining me this week is Eric Van Allen. Hello, hello, hello. You, <laughs> y'all who were watching the live stream, missed a lot of hijinks early. You got to tune into the <laughs> Stars of Destiny for some of that, because, woo. No comment. Um, Nadia has gone out to buy cigarettes or some. I, I think that's how the bit goes. Actually, she's at the Midwestern Gaming Classic. So we have two special guests this week. First of all, it's my friend and colleague. It's Mitchell Saltzman. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. And joining us once again, it's our returning pal, Brendan Groom. Welcome. welcome. Why am I saying welcome? I don't know how this works. <laughs> You're welcoming me. It's my yes, first I'm time. welcoming Mitch, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for having me back. I'm excited for today's topics and shenanigans. Shenanigans. Yes, we have Mitchell and Brendan on because uh, we had a great idea from the Discord. We're going to do it this week. And that is talking about the intersection of fighting games and RPGs. And uh, Mitchell, if you're not familiar with his work from IGN.com, Mitchell is really, really good at fighting games. He, I remember when Street Fighter VI was in, first announced, he did kick my butt at it. It was a good time. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was constantly impressed. You've uh, also like actually competed in Evo and stuff. We were all rooting for you. Yeah. Um, I, it, I started in 2019 and it was just so much fun that every, every opportunity I've had since then to, to go back and, uh, compete, I've done it again. So yeah, it's, it's just the most fun experience in the world going to, to Evo and being able to, you know, be part of that atmosphere and contribute even in a small way to it. But we'll be getting to that topic in just a moment. But first, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. <clears throat> if you enjoy the show, <clears throat> I'm going to cough a little bit. If you enjoy the show, please leave us a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Uh, please support us on Patreon, where for just $1, you can get the show ad-free. And you can join our Discord, where currently we are playing uh, near Automata. That's a, a little bit of a... Well, it's not exactly a, a fighting game, but if you squint really hard, you can kind of imagine a world in which it might be, I suppose. Um, She's in it, several fighting games. 2B is yeah, in a fighting yeah, game, I was about to say. Games. Yeah. Multiple fighting games. Wow, well, maybe we can talk about that a little bit in the upcoming segment. Uh, we recently put out our premium podcast, Pantheon of the Blood God. It's live now for all of our $10 and above subscribers. Uh, this past month, we played Suikoden two and we had special guests Shivambot and harper j on to talk about that one that was a really great deep dive into sweet in two as usual please go to follow us on all of our social channels go and buy merch at shop.bloodgodpod.com where you can get things like this cool mug i don't know all right let's talk about the intersection <clears throat> of fighting games and rpgs this is how the idea came about. One day, I, I kind of went into the community chat and basically said, look, we have our own ideas uh, of what to talk about, but we're in our own bubble. We've also done like 500 of these episodes. What do you want to hear us talk about? And Supermoop said, late to this, but my random episode idea is the connections between RPGs and fighting games. Two often very different types of games that nevertheless have some fun connections. Developers, characters, mechanics, etc. So let's talk about the intersection of fighting games and RPGs. And I'll start with long ago when I was playing RPGs on PlayStation, I did like fighting games. I still like fighting games. I was, I believe at the time, uh, a Street Fighter fan. And I loved the idea of doing inputs um, while playing RPGs. I'd be like, but what if I had a turn-based menu system and I was actually doing special moves and inputs? That would be sick. And then I played Xenogears. And that was <laughs> a, <laughs> a pretty fun game. Uh, not exactly the same, but it did scratch a little bit of that itch. Similarly, in Valkyrie Profile, um, there's a lot of timing and frame counting um, uh, for the way that you deal with your individual combos and how your party um, links up. So right from the start, you could see uh, RPG developers in their minds kind of going in a 
a similar direction. And I'm wondering if there was a point, if there was ever a point where you can remember the first times perceiving a sort of an intersection between fighting games and uh, RPGs. And why don't I ask you first, uh, Mitchell? Uh, I don't know if I can think of the first time. I can think of a recent example. Uh, a lot of, uh, I, I see Tifa in Final Fantasy Rebirth being described as like a, a character for fighting game fans in in that game because you know she's got moves where she can like use her uppercut to get into the air and then she can cancel that into a dive kick um she's got all kinds of like guard canceling abilities where like she's the only character that can like cancel the animation of of an attack into a guard um she can link her special moves together um it's just she one of the reasons why i love rebirth's combat so much is because every character just has all this all these different levels of hidden nuance and uh, tifa just i think has some of the most and a lot of it is owed back to you know some fighting game you know development knowledge i guess um but yeah i think other than that um i'm trying to think yeah i mean like i guess i guess going back to like uh you know, as early as Super Mario RPG and just the idea of mm. like, you know, precisely timing inputs to to increase, uh, you know, your damage or, or block something like, you know, the the parry from Street Fighter 3, you know, could be traced yeah. back to, you know, d defending certain really hard to defend multi hitting attacks mm. in Super Mario RPG. Yeah, it's funny because when I think about Tifa, I I feel like I've never really gotten her in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. A lot of people say she is one of the most enjoyable characters to play in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been I've found her one of the toughest players characters. She definitely is in that game. Yeah, she definitely is. Uh, she you know she's very fast. Uh... You kind of have to be thinking very fast in order to to kind of maximize her her potential. But yeah, once once you're able to do stuff like you know doing the unbridled strength to to get her charges and then use that to build up the the multiplier and stagger, she's I I honestly don't like taking her out of my party because I feel like she is instrumental in dealing big damage once you once you stagger people. I think Tifa from Rebirth is a really interesting example because over here you have like her as a character. She has a lot of the moves that you would expect from a fighting game character, right? She has the sort of launcher type stuff where you can actually throw her into the air to start in air mm -hmm. combo with one of the, the team up attacks. You've got installs, which are a very like common fighting game term. You've got like, like Mitch was saying all these like special cancels and stuff like that and things that will have different properties depending on when you do them, how you use them. But then I look at like Yuffie who almost feels like mm. a different take on a fighting game character in an RPG where Yuffie almost feels like a set play character where you're like playing Yuffie in Rebirth reminded me of playing Milia in Guilty Gear where I was trying to throw out this uh um oh what does she have it's the spinny blade shuriken sure is it the shuriken the uh, the chakram or whatever like like the oh, giant blade. yeah yeah you, you throw that out and then you start doing your elemental attacks and then you can kind of summon your doppelganger and now you're like mirroring attacks and you can start to like stagger how you approach those and input different things with it and it's like a completely different fighting game character to the point that i was i was really impressed by the way they did the kit design in rebirth because it did feel like they looked at action games and especially like fighting games for how to take a character make them feel very individual give them this kind of like not just set play but like identity of how they want to operate on the battlefield how that differs from everybody else and then what their kind of like win state what their damage state is right like how they get in the zone and that almost like bleeds into mmos where okay what is your rotation in an MMO is honestly not that far from what's your bread and butter in a fighting game. <laughs> so mm -hmm. not to like galaxy bring this uh, too fast, but there are a lot of those links. But for me, like I, I made this link years and years ago when I bought a little game called tales of symphonia on the GameCube. 
and I was playing that game and I had not played many fighting games up to that point. You know, I played a lot of Capcom versus SNK2 and stuff like that. I knew the basics of what a fighting game was, but I wasn't deep into the the mindset, like the the literal place that you have to get to to start to think of like, okay, this is how you play a fighting game. This is how I space things out. This is why I should do a fireball instead of just tossing fireballs to toss fireballs. Uh, and then playing Tales of Symphonia, trying to do some of those high-level combos and beat some of those bosses, I realized I was learning fighting game techniques because I had to think about, okay, this is, I got a block. It's not my turn yet. Okay, now it's my turn. Now I got to dump my damage on. What's my combo? What's my good combo that I can reliably get out? And um, how can I extend it? Um, how can I catch people? What are the gaps in their combos that I can catch them on? And I realized that Tales taught me how to play fighting games. Uh, so... Yeah, there are a lot of intersections between RPGs and fighting games that I think have just gotten even stronger as the years have gone on. Yeah, I, I think what, what it comes down to is that a lot of action RPGs take a lot from, you know, just straight up action games like Devil May Cry, et cetera, et cetera. And those games, you know, also, you know, Hide I think, uh, what was it? Hideaki Itsuno was the, the person behind Devil May Cry 3. He also worked on, you know, fighting games before that. I think he worked on Rival Schools. And he took a lot of that knowledge into Devil May Cry. And then Devil May Cry went and, you know, influenced a bunch of different action RPGs out there. But yeah, I think the, the, the whole thing of, like, you know, waiting for your turn is something that is very fighting game-esque and is also something that you see in a lot of uh, action RPGs these days. What about you, Brendan? So when you asked this question and when I was invited to come on here, I was thinking a lot about these things because I think there's a lot of very overt things now that link these two genres. Um, but I tried to kind of noodle on it some more and dig back and figure out if I ever made that connection early on because like, I do have a lot of love for games like Super Mario RPG with... In, kind of all the Mario RPGs is they have that timing based mechanic in the combat, Sea of Stars, stuff like that. But I always kind of like liken that to rhythm games. But I can also understand why that would be very kind of DNA focused on uh, fighting games and, and RPGs as well. But I think for me, it's the more that I thought about it, it's it's twofold. It's from a certain point forward, probably either the Versus series or Smash Brothers 4, there's always been this like we're getting fighting game we're, we're getting RPG characters into fighting games as guest characters or as just main roster characters because it's something like smash um and i think that though so for some of those things it was always like a, a matter of oh i you know i couldn't control this character a different way before and now i can control them in this in this way and it's like in some ways for older games it's like the realization of oh this is what ness would really be doing in earthbound and not the you know i don't see these characters do these attacks and stuff like that and then i think the other thing is <laughs> and you can probably make this connection for a lot of different genres but i i do think that like baseline game mechanic wise and just kind of game theory a lot of things that apply to fighting games apply to rpgs and I think that's sort of why not only do the two genres have a lot of overlap, but I think that's why that community has a lot of overlap because you you really, like, good RPGs and good fighting games are built around good systems and good mechanics within those games. And I think that more so than a lot of other types of games, you really, if you want to excel super high in fighting game or you know, min-max your way through a good RPG, you want to take advantage of and exploit those systems. And I think that a lot of what makes good RPG systems work and good um, fighting game systems work are, like, learning the intricacies of those specific mechanics and excelling at them. And I think a lot of overlap kind of happens between certain games more than others within those two genres. Uh, plus there's also, I, I guess I'll throw a third one in there. There's like super overt things like Soul Calibur. I feel like for a while has had a lot of single player modes that are very RPG focused or any fighting game that allows you to like not just create a character, but create a character and change their moveset or take a 
character that's in the roster and augment their moveset, um, which I don't personally gel with those. Like, I don't, that's not how I choose to play a lot of fighting games, but it's there. And I think it's there because that player is in that same Venn diagram. Uh, Mitchell, what's your history with RPGs out of curiosity? Uh, growing up, you know, as a SNES kid, like big into Chrono Trigger, that was like my favorite game. You know, it's still one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, big into Final Fantasy VI. Uh, I you know, dabbled a little bit into the, the Mana series. Uh, and then I became kind of like a Dreamcast uh, RPG fan with Skies of Arcadia, Grandia 2. So, like, it was, it was one of, like, my defining genres growing up. Um, mm. I kind of fell out of it. It like once the the Dreamcast and like PS2 or sorry not Dreamcast sorry the the GameCube and like PS2 era era hit I I missed a lot of like the really popular ones during that time and then uh, yeah I kind of came back around into it kind of you know in the the modern era with like you know Yakuza like a Dragon um, some of the later Dragon Quest games so it's it's a genre that I hold close to my heart even though it hasn't been a part of my like gaming life for you know like the whole the whole time what what drew you to rpgs out of curiosity um i think it was a desire to get something more out of a game story at the time um mm. you know being able one of the things that really drew me to mario rpg was to be able to see the mario characters and see the the Mushroom Kingdom world, like fully realized, as an actual lived-in space, um, and also just you know to be able to you know sink my teeth into into an actual story in a video game because you know at at that time that wasn't really the focus of, of video games. It was more just about you know skill tests and platforming mm-hmm. games and you know those those kind of things. So it was, it, that I think that was kind of what really drew me to it. I was actually just thinking about how fighting games are experiencing a little bit of a renaissance. Is that kind of fair to say? Would you two oh, yeah. agree with that? 100%. Yeah, I, I would go as far as to say we are currently in the golden era of fighting games. I think the FGZ really? has never been stronger. I think we're like... New golden in, age. In, yeah, the golden in, age. It really is. For sure. Yes. We were talking about this last night, I think, Brendan, that like um the there were a lot of like dark eras in the fighting game community. Like Street Fighter Four was a really high point, I think, brought a lot of people together. And then kind of Street Fighter Five was what Street Fighter Five was. And uh a lot of people kind of went to different games at that point. Street Fighter Five was around and it was certainly popular, but it was like begrudgingly popular. I, I think I, I remember doing interviews with a lot of players at the time, and a lot of them were just like, "Look, we're playing this game because it's the game. It is like if you are a Street Fighter player, you have to play the Street Fighter game." But not a lot of people were happy about it, and it a lot of the enthusiasm felt like it was being sucked out of the room. And then Dragon Ball Fighters came around, I think reignited something in the FGC, and then Tekken Seven was also like Tekken Seven's been a great game, but Tekken Seven I think really had a kick up around that time too, where these storylines, these players were emerging. It was hitting the broader consciousness, and then you hit the point where like Street Fighter Six and Tekken Eight are both out, and they're both pretty frankly excellent. Some people are still grumbling about Tekken Eight. I don't know. I don't agree with it, but um, there's like it's really never been a better time to be a fighting game player. <laughs> it's uh, mm. but it, but it really is like we're we're in an era where all these games, even Strive, I, I didn't even mention Guilty Gear, but like Strive is doing super well. If you play fighting games, there is like a flavor of everything out there for you, and also the fighting games themselves are becoming, I think, incredibly interesting to follow and watch. And and one of the things I wanted to highlight for the intersection of RPGs and fighting games is how fighting games have been incorporating. RPG design and other design. Um, There's a character in Strive that came out as part of the DLC rollout. Uh, I think they're called Asuka. Uh, But they basically play Slay the Spire while they're fighting. Like their whole thing is that they have a hand of cards and they can spend those cards using fireball inputs and then can like refresh their hand and they have a mana system. And they're basically playing a deck builder live in the middle of a match. And 
when they first came out, they were very much like, oh my God, it's the most like complicated character you've ever seen. But now you watch players who understand that character and you're watching it like, this is a fighting game. They're playing a fighting game, but they're also playing these incredible head games. And you look at like what um, Dragon Quest Hero, how that was imported into Smash and the way they incorporated the command menu and stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. It's really interesting to watch these fighting games incorporate RPG elements to build up this new depth now that players are a little bit more accustomed to how a fighting game handles now that like okay everybody knows how to play Ryu right so like how can we innovate the design that we have for these new characters while we're seeing a lot of really wild things and a lot of them do feel very RPG coded uh you can also sorry I was just gonna say you can also bring up Street Fighter 6 and the world tour mode which you know is kind of like you know one of the the most earnest attempts at bringing RPGs into you know a story mode of of a fighting game. Uh, you know you could argue about the success of it, but you know it's the fact is there's a level up system, there's open world exploration, there's quests, there's you know a loot system basically where you can go to an item shop, you can get new equipment to boost your stats and stuff. Um, you know the I think the big thing about you know the co- combination of these two genres it's they are kind of opposed in that fighting games are all about you know the individual skill and you know you mastering a, a character that has you know this kind of on an equal playing field as as another character even, even though there there might be different tier lists there's still like you know the same general power stats versus an RPG where it's all about building your character up from a you know a, a very weakened state to a very powerful state um i do think that there is probably more that they can do with that connection but it 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 involves like really diving into like you know my my dream is to have a fighting game where it's just one character it's an rpg you're playing as one character from the beginning at the beginning you have just a, a few basic attacks and at every stage you you add a new like kind of ability to your rep- repertoire okay so you you fight like uh the first boss who you try to jump in on him he'll sure you can and after you beat him you get a sure you can and then you just kind of build up this character to eventually become like a fully rounded fighting game character over the course of the whole game that's my stupid dream <laughs> but i i just i would love to see that kind of connection uh you know intensified or, or enhanced in a, in a way that uh you know makes them mesh a little better that would uh that would actually be a really cool idea for like a roguelite where you start mm-hmm. with like a very base set of moves and as mm-hmm. you progress mm-hmm. it's a random roll of different like enemies or bosses that have special abilities I, I that would be a really cool roguelite. let's make an indie game together brendan let's do it. Let's do it. I'm down. <laughs> did any of you ever play the street fighter tabletop game street no. fighter tabletop game yeah, there was a tabletop uh, game. I don't know what the system was. Maybe it was GURPS or something like that. But long ago, I was obsessed with Street Fighter 2. And I bought the RPG source book because in those days, pre-Wikipedia, that was the best way to learn about the lore of a potential world. For example, a lot of... St- Star Wars lore that we know of today came from the old tabletop books in the early 90s, which then were picked up by the video games and then eventually filtered into the expanded universe, which then filtered into the Disney world and is still uh, appearing to this day. Names like, I believe the name Coruscant and Emperor Palpatine might have come from the RPG source books. Please check my uh, please fact check me on this one. I, either that or Timothy Zahn came up with them. I digress. My point is, that was the first time that I read about all the lore of all of the Street Fighter characters, and I was desperate to know more about the story and the world building. And there's a reason for that. I think the biggest intersection between specifically Japanese fighting games and Japanese RPGs is that they both have big manga roots. Um, at their mm. at their heart, fighting games are kind of a shonen tournament tournament arc. We were talking about how Dragon Ball 
Z invented the tournament arc. Street Fighter 2 is the is just a tournament arc in video game form with all of the characters doing their superpowers and everything. And RPGs also have specifically Japanese RPGs have big manga roots as well. And so the kind of people who would be drawn into that kind of media, the kind of people who would be watching Dragon Ball Z or Pokemon, uh, it's no surprise then that fighting games and RPGs would have sort of a similar fandom in some ways. Um, Certainly it reflects in the art style, I think, even uh, to this day, especially as artists lean more and more and more into Japanese inspirations, which necessarily come from a long um, history of manga. Yeah, absolutely. I I look at games like, again, the Tales series, and you can see the connective tissue so easily uh, from the gameplay, obviously, but even in the design, like you were saying, and then we have years of Akira Toriyama, uh, Akira Toriyama art uh, <laughs> and and stuff like that to to draw the, like the very obvious connection points of RPGs to manga, manga to fighting games, and then the through line through that. So yeah, and and then you also have you know just the straight up connections of the Persona fighting games. You know you've got mm. you know Persona Four Arena uh, that just literally takes the characters of Persona and just you know tweaks them a bit to to make them fit into a fighting game. Uh, I would love to see that happen more. I think that there's a lot of really cool crossover between characters and mechanics uh, that uh, you know they've only really scratched the surface of. I'm telling y'all, the Final Fantasy 14 fighting game it, it needs to happen. We've got you know, the dropouts. Put the dropouts on this. We'll take care of the roster. We'll figure it out. Uh, like I I was playing 14 last night because I'm in the middle of my relic weapon grind. And I was sitting there just running through my rotations because that's what you do in an MMO, right? Like you have your your GCDs, your your global cooldown rotation, just what you do. And then as you kind of learn how to play those characters, especially like Dragoon, which was my main, you learn how to kind of pepper in stuff where you're like, okay, I did my step one and two of my rotation, but now I've got like enough time to weave as they call it like maybe two extra attacks some of my like longer cooldowns my extra jumps and stuff like that that is the same thing as when i was playing tekken 8 and learning how to play reina i was like okay i've learned my bread and butter my like do 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 but now before i like hit them with my big attack that sends them to the wall i can link in another combo i can do a little dun 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 and then add (laughs) an extra hit after that now i'm extending the combo it's the same thing the same thing is happening across it so like that can easily go back the other way and and mitch you you bring up a great example in in persona 4 arena like i don't think i've seen a game so excellently take another game's concepts and turn them into a different genre entirely while still maintaining the vibe, the idea of what personas are, how those RPG mechanics work, how they differ between characters. Uh, it's really incredible. And I would love to see more people do that. We have to mention Urgies. We can't have this mm-hmm. episode and not mention I was Urgies say. at some point, <laughs> even though should we mention Urgies, but, <laughs> but even stuff like Dissidia, I think is really fan- fascinating because mm. Dissidia is weird because it's like, it's more like a virtual on, right? It's more like yeah. a a like arena combat game, which is nebulous on whether you consider that a fighting game or not. But th- that's also taking these like famous RPG characters, Final Fantasy characters, and turning them into action characters that now have to do action combat things, but you're still maintaining the idea of how do they play? How do they handle? How do you replicate those systems the way that that character should play in a non turn based or non ATB system. And I would love to see more of that. I a hundred percent agree. I didn't my memories are of Dissidia or Hazy. I played a lot of Dissidia Duodecim um in particular, but I doesn't the way that it plays kind of match a little bit of Final Fantasy Seven Rebirth in the uh keep hitting the enemy until they break and then try and do the maximum amount of damage possible. Um, it's been a long. Am time I wrong for remembering game. that? Yeah, and then would not surprise there, me. <laughs> and there are super attacks that you can do and everything. 
There was one thing that kind of drove me crazy about Final Fantasy in that era, maybe even to an extent now. Why can they all fly? <laughs> is it just like a Dragon Ball thing? It's like, the, the, now Cloud can fly. I don't know. Oh, for Dissidia specifically? Yeah. I think that is like a tack on effect of being a virtual on alike, is you need that ability. Advent to like Children. Boost. I mean, Advent Children kind of had it too. They were all flying. Mm-hmm in that game or the movie many, whatever is that really the point in final fantasy 7 where you're like all right i've suspended my disbelief long enough yeah. why can you fly like i was that the breaking point for you cat <laughs> yeah a little bit um uh, hear me out okay i think it's i'm totally into <laughs> fantastical concepts like uh you know drawing my mana from the world and me- meteors being summoned by magic and talking giant dogs. Godzilla like weapons. <laughs> but I do like something to feel grounded. And if the characters are just full Super Saiyan, then at a certain point, I lose my connection to the reality and I can't um, suspend my disbelief. That's Cat's all. Sitting there at the end of the Matrix, like this is completely unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse me, it, he could fly because he's in the computer. It's fine, but, but they're not in the computer. He flies in the real world. He flies in the real world later. <laughs> well, they messed it up later. Then it got stupid. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Right. the original right. Matrix this is now was a podcast good. About the Matrix. Um, I um, mean, it is the 25th anniversary. Happy yeah. anniversary to the Matrix. Hell yeah. Uh, Brendan, you were going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say on the flip side, like, I would also love to see more fighting games get RPG treatment. Like, I, Project X Zone is fantastic. And granted, that's like a lot of things happening at once. But, and it's a lot of, you know, fan service and and other games and and franchises and whatnot coming together. But I feel like you can absolutely, because I think for most fighting games, for me at least, I don't want to speak for everybody, but the story mode is usually like the thing I care the least about. Like I love the story of these characters and I like the world of these, of these games, but usually I care way less about playing those modes, save for some specific ones. Um, and I think a great way because of this intersection to like explore these characters and these worlds would be in an RPG, tactical RPG, whatever it may be. I, th- I think there's a lot, like, I think there is, a, a very deep well there that for some reason no one's really exploring unless am i wrong game. for am i wrong for feeling like there was actually a street fighter tactical rpg at some point or is that just project cross zone that might have been just <laughs> project cross yeah. zone. i think that but... might have literally been project cross zone yeah. um I, I mean you're not wrong though like a party-based street fighter game would be kind of sick actually <laughs> I mean, th- think about this too, like, at least for me, and again, maybe I'm just showing my own hand here, no one else's, but some of the best fighting games for me, usually at its core, how I feel about them, is the roster. And I feel like that's mm-hmm. the same for an RPG. Like, if I like the party, I'm way more invested in what's going on in that game. If I like the roster, I'm way more invested in that fighting game. Like, I would say, like, I'm a Street Fighter's probably my, like, my my branch off of the tree as far as like core fighting games. And I would say a game like, you know, third strike is arguably one of the most technically sound best street fighter fighting games. But I personally think it has one of the worst rosters. It still has good characters and stuff and a lot of new faces, but like, I love a game like alpha three, which is probably not a gr- super great fighting game. Like it, I think it might've the alpha series brought in like the isms, which I'm, I'm a fan of, but it has a way better roster in my opinion. And I think that I usually will gel towards that. So taking a good fighting game party and putting them into an RPG is like just a marriage that I'm all for. So we, we do also have to recognize that there was a Sam show role playing game for the Neo Geo CD. Uh, which the uh, one Neo Geo RPG <laughs> yeah. that ever happened. <laughs> yeah, uh, this this thing exists theoretically, conceptually it does exist. Uh, but Brendan, you're right. Like the idea of, I keep thinking of Grand Blue Fantasy because maybe that's the the blueprint is Grand Blue Fantasy versus is obviously like a a fairly popular fighting game. Uh, in in the anime fighting game scene, and it's based off of Grand Blue Fantasy, the the gacha game, which then also has now Grand Blue Fantasy Relink, which kind of tells that story, but in a 
single player slash multiplayer monster hunter adjacent like action rpg setting and maybe that's the way more fighting game franchises that have that sort of like breadth should operate is like okay we've got our fighting game over here that's what you play if you want to be competitive and then if you want the story if you want something really really neat and and involved now we've got like here's a monster hunter game but with the characters of tekken so you have like Jin and king and uh name other randoms out of like like xiao yu and stuff like that all teaming up to fight like the the devil thing from tekken 3 and stuff like that and they're doing these big like fights and things like that i think that's the other hard part is that fighting games operate on a certain (laughs) scale of they're they're one-on-one combat so like trying to do an rpg is a little bit more difficult because you have to not only have a party on one side but like opponents that make sense power scale wise and i keep trying to like think of who would the street fighter cast fight if not just an endless revolving door of like M Bison soldiers, right? And now we've just created the beat 'em up. <laughs> now we've just gone all the way around and created the beat 'em up. So, yeah, uh, I keep going back to sorry, uh, one second. I keep going back to okay. what Brendan was saying um, with the the rosters and everything, and how character designs are such a huge part of the appeal of. Um, of fighting games and RPGs. I totally agree with that. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth has... We had a big discussion about whether or not FF7 Rebirth has the best pure cast out of any Final Fantasy. It's certainly some of the most memorable and iconic designs mm-hmm. out of uh, all of them, right? They're just fun to have. Also, secretly, fighting games have character classes. You have heavies. You have DPS characters. You have highly technical grappling characters, and it's not that dissimilar. The main thing that fighting games are missing are healers, because uh, healers are kind of oh, a, kind of annoying. Oh, you can play um, Elena in SF4, and you can do some healing. You can do some healing. <laughs> match. Oh, man. Those are the days. Uh, you're, you're right, though, that like they do have the overlap in terms of just like a character design that has to fit within a combat system that has an identity, right? Like, so you have uh, a character that is going to be kind of your all rounder. That's your Ryu or your warrior, you know, depending on whether you're going RPG or fighting games, but now, okay, you've got uh, your berserker or your grappler. Who's going to be like very all in on a certain play style. That's high risk, high reward. And then maybe you've got, someone who's very reliant on setup on like executing a certain damage window and getting a lot of damage out of it but you have to kind of plan that and plot that out so that's a set play character or a mage and it's cool how you can start to kind of draw those lines and then see again how they intersect and overlap between games because another one i want to shout out in this episode is chained echoes has a character that is very fighting game adjacent is like a monk style character that has a lot of stuff where you can kind of build up these charges and then expend them for extra damage on attacks and they're all based off of different stances that the character goes into so they play a lot like um oh gosh it's it's lay from from tekken that has like the the snake stance and the and and the different stances and all that um has a lot of those ideas and even within chained echoes there are other characters like the uh the red-headed uh samurai uh lady who who like builds up charges and can expend them on special things it's a very fighting game thing to build up charges and then use them that's like what jury does in street fighter right so i think it's really cool to find those those overlaps and, and again like we, we just got to find a way to make this ha- we got to make the final fantasy 14 like fighting game happen arxis where are you you're not making fighters <laughs> too let's talk about this <laughs> Uh, just well, first totally off, separate it, it, from it. Go ahead. Mitchell. I was just going to say, first off, if, if Arxis is going to make anything else, the first thing that they need to do is a One Piece fighting game. <laughs> that's that's the, the only Gundam thing I'll accept battle from games. Okay, but what <laughs> Bring about back Hunter Gundam Hunter? the battle. <laughs> They're already making a Hunter Hunter uh, fighting game. What about a different uh, Hunter Hunter fighting game? <laughs> <laughs> Aiding's uh, making a Hunter Hunter fighting game. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm it looks like it's going to be uh, Marvel. Like, it's going to be like Marvel adjacent. Um, but it, what I was going to say is that, like, uh, I think one thing that we should mention, even though it's not uh, coming from an RPG property, uh, I think we got a shout out to XKO, which is taking, you know, yes. the 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 MOBA genre and, you know, making a, a fighting game out of it. And just Riot has just in general done such a great job of expanding the world of League of Legends into different genres. Um, and I, I am so 
dang excited for two two XKO and just like the the way that uh you know it also takes you know the archetypes of a MOBA and makes them into you know the archetypes of a fighting game like you have uh Darius who's now this hulking bruiser of a man who just like you know, swings this giant axe that goes mm-hmm. halfway across the screen and rips people in and like mm-hmm. you know adapts the 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 core moves of League of Legends into into the the fighting game world Ugh, it's just it's so good and I'm so excited for that game can can I take you for a ride here can can oh, I oh I want I sh- you to take me for a ride <laughs> can I can I show you how two XKO is maybe the perfect example for this pod because it is a full circle moment. So mm-hmm. RTS games, they're trying to innovate. Blizzard's thinking about how do we make something new for Warcraft three. They look to tabletop RPGs and they bring in these hero units that gain levels, can hold items. They're basically like having your own little D and D character inside an RTS, which is very novel for the time. They'd had named units and stuff like that before that could have special abilities that that you know operated a little bit differently but now they have it like hard coded into the system here are hero units modders you know users create this new game mode based off of something from starcraft becomes dota defense of the ancients where you play as just that hero unit in a larger conflict that becomes the moba genre through league of legends now that's being turned into a fighting game and we have gone full (laughs) circle from here's this thing inspired by tabletop rpgs to reinvent a piece of the rts genre to now that design philosophy is being incorporated into fighting games and even within league of legends you have ruin king which is like an rpg approach to that stuff and you can see the threads so clearly you can see those ideas and i totally agree with you it's fascinating to see how these design ideas can carry over genre to genre and influence and push each genre forward as they go. And I think that's what's really fascinating about the intersection of fighting games and RPGs is it, it isn't just one place and it isn't just one time. And it isn't just one way. It's all happening over and over again as these genres butt into each other and create these new ideas. And one influences the other and the other influences the other back. And I think that's the cool part about watching games as a whole, as a medium evolve, as we see how these overlaps create something new. And now we're at a point where years ago, somebody was like, well, we need to make strategy games a little bit different. Let's put hero units in them. And now we have RPG design ideas inside a fighting game because of it. It's fascinating to me. And that's just how the, the medium grows because, you know, we go from, you know, what we understand of what a fighting game could be. And then you experiment a little bit by adding some new genres into it. And that's how new genres get, you know, get created. And uh, yeah, I just, I think that there's a lot of room to to expand the this, you know, connection between RPGs and fighting games that is only going to serve to make both of them better. <clears throat> yeah, I think that both fighting games and RPGs are highly flexible genres, and it's. It says something that you could theoretically say, turn that into an RPG or turn that into a fighting game. And you can do that with virtually anything, honestly. Uh, one thing that we didn't talk about, actually, another connection is Grand Blue Fantasy, which we, uh, Cram, Grand Blue Fantasy Relink has gone uh, criminally uncovered on this, but it basically started as a gotcha uh, mobile game, which is its own species of RPGs and then it became a fighting game and now it's become sort of a monster hunter like game. So uh, another good example there. We're running out of time for Mitchell who has to go after this segment, but I was going to ask, is there anything the RPG genre specifically can learn from the current evolution and renaissance of fighting games? What do you think, Mitchell? Mm, uh, I think like, experimentation with uh with character archetypes is is something that maybe they could take away like um you're mentioning asuka which which is a fighting games character that has no basis of anything before it um and it's just the i think it it kind of speaks volumes of uh arc system works's willingness to experiment with different uh character archetypes 
Um, you also have a character like Abba, who was just released. Mm. And even though that was a character that existed before, she's such a weird character. She is a character who is literally the worst, the worst character in the game in her base form. But once she hits these certain conditions, she's able to transform into this absolute monster for just a short period of time. Um, and yeah, just, I... So I think that's that's kind of where I would go. Just you know, more experimentation of uh, of of the different you know established you know roles of a of an RPG party. How about you, Brendan? Uh, I I think okay. Well, first of all, listen, Square has all the success with remaking a, a beloved game, Capcom. Make Capcom vs. SNK two available on modern let's platforms. Go, let's go. That's let's all go. I'm asking for. There please. you go. Um, no, that aside, I think um, kind of a lot of what Mitchell was saying, but also maybe looking at certain like core fighting game mechanics and seeing how you can maybe tweak some of those into uh, you know similar RPG mechanics like. Uh, limit bars or super gauges, like all these things are like super important in a lot of fighting games where you're building up a meter um, to, to get super moves and stuff like that. I think an interesting take could be something like instead of that meter being something you're building up for special moves, maybe it's a, you know, different characters in the roster have evolutions within a match and you could use that super gauge to like evolve a character. So you add this level of strategy outside of the regular strategy of a fighting game where it's like, okay, are they going to evolve Ryu or are they going to evolve Chun-Li or whatever it may be? And you add this extra level of strategy that I think is kind of just working outside the bounds of the fist to fist strategy that's going on within. Um, I think playing around with those types of ideas and mechanics, I think there's just, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of fun stuff, even if it's like not the main mode of the, of the next fighting game, if it's just, you know, an additional arcade mode or something to play around with mechanics and see what sticks and, and see where, where people go. Cause uh, I, th I think the other core overlap between these two communities is that like, they're not niche, but there's so much niche within them and the communities in both of these genres are very very loyal to franchises or to you know whatever just to the to the genre uh I, I can't tell you how many times someone begs me to play like the trails series or whatever it may be it's like that th those people are going to latch onto that stuff and i think that they will be there for the ride for the experimentation too yeah you definitely have fighting game evangelists in the same way that you have rpg Mm -hmm. evangelists but uh eric any uh final thoughts yeah uh you know i i did want to highlight one thing we didn't talk too much about that i'm not going to go along on but i was just going to say that like even when you get into the competitive side of fighting games uh you get into stuff that feels very rpg like team building is a major thing in games like dragon ball fighters and marvel versus capcom which having like a team core identity and gameplay that you're playing against somebody else's RPG party essentially, uh, which is really really cool. I love I loved the Marvel three era because you had people who had like oh I I'm running uh, Zero May Cry or I'm running like a Phoenix team or I'm running a so and so team and it's it's really fun to watch because of that because there's that element of parties. But in terms of what RPGs could learn from fighting games, especially in this golden era, uh, we had I was having a very heated discussion the other night about uh, Baldur's Gate three and how uh, parts oh, no. of that. Parts of that game can feel impenetrable if you've not played D and D before, um, and I think something I was thinking about as we were talking about the golden age of fighting games was how a lot of fighting games today have tried to open the door for people, have tried to say, "Here's modern inputs. Here are tutorials. So many tutorials. The Tekken Eight tutorial is so extensive and fascinating. It even has like rhythm mini games inside it where you can hear like the doom doom doom, so you know like the cadence that you're supposed to push the buttons at." Um, and part of me does like I don't want to sand down the edges of Baldur's Gate 3 and make it a less interesting system but I do almost wish there was a way to go into like some magical book with withers and have him be like okay we're going to teach you how to use terrain to your advantage and things like that <laughs> and and like I I look at the way that fighting games have used tutorials and teaching 
not to make their games less complex, but to make their games more approachable. And I think that is something mm-hmm. that I do think as, as RPGs get more complex, as we get into these eras of games like Baldur's Gate 3 and stuff like that, that it's worth considering how do we keep the door open for people who are not accustomed to this style of game, who are not used to playing this stuff. You know, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a great video game that has some incredible depth to it. It's also got barriers. It's got friction. And I, I'm not saying they should just put a tutorial in that game, but I'm saying that like clearly fighting game developers have been thinking for years about how do we get more people to play fighting games And I think some RPG developers could also start to look at that and say, like, how are we tutorializing? How are we opening the door? How are we creating systems in our game to get people to engage with the things that we are doing and to continue to develop that? Because I think that is one of, like, the best ways that you can get more people involved with the medium and sharing it, like like Brennan was talking about. So, yeah, Hmm. I I would... Maybe I would like the the Baldur's Gate three dojo of <laughs> like here go do your your player handbook training with Withers if you want to learn like how dipping your weapon works or how bonus actions uh take place and stuff like that because I you know there is some friction there and I would love to see uh studios tackle that sort of thing. Yeah, shout out to Unicorn Overlord, which does a really great job of teaching yes. all of its different systems. Uh, through different maps and everything, because that's a complex game, but it really breaks it down for you in a way that I find uh, pretty admirable. But you're not wrong. Two very complex genres, which I think draws in a certain type of player. But plenty more to break down on this one. I mean, we didn't even talk about, say, Mortal Kombat, for example, which I think is its own particular beast and uh, is worth mentioning in its own way. But maybe we'll get to that. Um, at another time we're going to take a little break uh, because Mitchell has to go Um, and then after that we're going to jump into the random encounters so don't go away Now it's time for a series of random encounters. Front Mission 2 Remake on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC has a release date. It's out on April 30th. CD Projekt's CFO says that he does not see a place for microtransactions in single-player games. Dragon's Dogma 2 has sold 2.5 million copies as the fixed frame rate arrives. Uh, Nobuo Uematsu has been confirmed for appearing in the Final Fantasy VII Remake Trilogy finale, um, composing some songs for that. Uh, Saber's CEO has said that KOTOR's remake is alive and well. That was an interview with our own Reb Valentine. Go check that out on IGN, as well as her excellent reporting on the culture within Deck Mm 9. And finally, Bloodborne Cart, which is now known as Nightmare Cart, has a release date. It's out on Steam and Itch.io on May 31st. Okay, rolling now into the tavern. Let's talk about what we've been playing, what's been standing out to us. And Brendan, you're a special guest this week. What have you been playing or what is interesting to you? Talk to us as we settle in next to the fire. Um, Let's see. I, I've been in like a weird space because after Rebirth, I was like, I don't, I don't really want a big thing. I kind of want to take a break, play some smaller stuff, jump around. 
And then I got sent a code for Unicorn Overlords. So I've been mm. playing that, uh, which I'm enjoying, but it's a it's a slow slow play for me. I'm kind of just taking my time with it. Um, but after the unfortunate passing of Toriyama, I was like, oh, I really need some some uh, Toriyama stuff in my life right now. So I decided to do what has been sitting on my backlog for a while, which was play some Dragon Quest games. So I played through Dragon Quest One for the first time, and it's an old RPG, <laughs> but it, it but it it's good at for what it is. Like I mean, it's it's eighty six maybe. I it's it's old, um. So it old game old sometimes. But I I love that world. I love obviously the art of those of that series. But it's kind of invigorated me to bump some of these other Dragon Quest games up further mm -hmm. on the list for me on my backlog this year, just because. I've played a lot of Dragon Quest, but I never finished a lot of Dragon Quest, so I kind of want to get back to that. Because I, when 11s came out on the Switch, that was like an immediate purchase. I played through like half that game, and then something else pulled me away, and then I never went back to it. So I'm kind of getting the itch to like maybe I restart 11s and forget games that are coming out right now. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm kind of all over the place, but mm. definitely in a. Eric and I were talking last night. We both need to get back to Chrono Trigger. Sorry to sorry to put you on blast, Eric. <sighs> yeah. Look, someone needs to put me on blast. <laughs> Eric, you know. Eric, what are you doing? Get back to Chrono Trigger. You got to finish it so you can then play Final Fantasy VI. Yeah, yeah. And then I already have an idea for the game I want to do after that, which is like so far down the line. We need to we need to start eating the veggies on our plate. So I've said it in the Discord. I'll say it here. I am going to restart the Chrono Trigger playthrough. We are going to finish Chrono Trigger. So if you're watching this live right now, tune in tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific here on this channel, and we will resume the Chrono Trigger. But uh, yeah, I, I want to finish that because I really do also want to get around to FF6. That's been like just on my brain constantly, like hounding me like like a like a devil, like a ghost, just being like... Mm -hmm. I, I really want to play FF6. I'm in such a mood for a Final Fantasy game. Uh, and then I won't talk about the game after that because I don't want to, like, curse myself. But it's another game that I've been deeply in the mood for. So we'll, yeah. we'll see. I'm, I'm in the same boat with you. After I finished Rebirth, I was, like, in such a Final Fantasy mood. And I, Final Fantasy is another one. I've played a lot of the not mainline games, like Tactics, mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I personally love Crystal Chronicles. Um I've played a lot of little bits of mainline Final Fantasy games, but I've never really finished any. So after Rebirth, I had a discussion with Eric and a few other people, friends of the show, you know, like Jesse Vitelli and Kenneth Shepard and stuff. Are we using and the land... Nasty Boys? Are we, are we publicizing I, yeah, Nasty Boys? Yeah, we could say boys? Nasty Boys. Giant Bob um, certainly seems to like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I landed on, well, I guess before I say what I landed on, because I did start a mainline Final Fantasy game, Cat, as somebody who has not played a lot of mainline Final Fantasy games, what would you suggest that I play? Oh, mm. oh interesting. Uh, I think that uh, a good option, if you want to go really old school, is the Pixel Remaster of FF4. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to play the absolute best game in the series, Final Fantasy VI, and if you want something a little more modern, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake, that, that's a good shout as well. So, Just okay. off the top of my head. Okay. I went with, after a lot of thought i went with 10 because i've never played okay 10. okay and what do you think have you started it i've i'm a few hours in i i pulled myself away for unicorn but i'll get back to yeah. it soon but uh i'm really liking it i i don't really care for titus that much but mm. the rest of the party's great <laughs> interesting Look, eric's that's... favorite character titus my maybe God. my opinion will change but i like at for now i'm just kind of like and maybe it Maybe it's like just the early part of the game, but I'm like, this dude kind of sucks. I can't believe it's my like lot in life to sit here and have to defend Titus and <laughs> Shinji Ikari. Titus is good, actually. Yeah, like like <laughs> Titus, Shinji Ikari, and me just all sitting in the corner with like the folding chair, like head down. <laughs> um, I have a question. Is there a way to uh, speed up the battles in 10? Because that game was kind of slow when I tried to pick it up again a little while the, ago. The Steam version has like speed options in the battle settings, I'm pretty sure. I'll have to look at uh, okay. that too. Okay. I, I, I don't know if I love any that. Any of the HD versions should also have that too, okay. I think. 
I don't know if I love the like the I don't know if it has a name. It might have a name, but just like the act of swapping out to like fill. I don't know if I love that. Like it's it's very interesting. You have, you, ha you have to be paying a lot of attention to mm. to that, and I don't know if that's in my in ten tea. like like swapping party members. Yeah, like so, like certain party members just straight up can't attack certain enemy types oh, and stuff. And you have to swap yeah. a lot. Um, I mean, they can attack know. certain enemy types. It's just that, like, if you have, like, Titus try to hit an ar armored enemy, for example, like, mm. he will struggle with that, whereas Orin naturally hits those enemies really, really yeah. hard. But then you do start to unlock things later in the game that either give you options for dealing with that. So, like, maybe okay. you let Titus learn magic and he can cast, like, fire or something like that. Okay. And that's his yeah. way of hitting a ranged enemy. Or you have him hold a weapon, like a sword that has the, like... I think it's called like armor break or something like, like mm -hmm. have a, have a thing on it that lets him hit Do enemies and not yeah. have the, like, um, it's the word I'm looking for. Like the opposite of bonus, um, not have the restriction on his attack. So yeah. the game starts out very early, basically being like, here are the things that you want to hit. Here are the party members you should hit them with. Like here, mm -hmm. Lulu kills the gel and Waka hits the flying guy, and Titus yeah. hits the wolf. And and you kind of just play like, it's the game designer like putting shapes into the, the, the yeah. circles and stuff. <laughs> and honestly, it is like that because at some point you can break the game so much that you can just start using the same shape over and over again to break everything. Um, yeah. But uh, I do think it opens up once you get to around like the, the me and high road and you start doing some of that stuff. Basically, once you have what is it like seven of the eight party members you ultimately have or eight of the nine i think um there's only one party member you get kind of late into the game and even then you get her about like halfway into the game you spend most of ff10 with your full party so um it's i i think very fast more than other rpgs they give you the tools that you're going to have so that you can start using things like the sphere grid and the different like um modification stuff you can do to abilities and all that to start to break the game open yeah I'll, admittedly I'll quickly... it's been a oh, sorry. Ad admittedly it's been a while since i played final fantasy 10 but my recollection is that the game really picks up after the initial blitzball tournament and it's a little yeah. slow to start otherwise which uh took which is one reason that it took me a while to actually finish final fantasy 10 i don't think i finished it until mm, well i mean a little while i finished it for the first time in christmas 2002 so about a year after it was initially released, but it took me a while to actually really get into it for that reason. But once you get past the Blitzball tournament and the laughing scene, I think uh, it really starts getting quite good. Okay. Uh, also, I love the, I do actually love the party swapping just because I like RPGs that manage to in a, uh, integrate the entire party. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I don't like that feeling of, well, this character who's kind of important is level five and has, and is so under level that I can never use them. And they're just going to sit on my bench forever. Um, I think Baldur's Gate three also does a really good job of letting you just bring in a party member if you want, just because they level up with everybody else. So mm -hmm. uh, that's nice. But yeah, uh, I think FF 10 certainly compared to earlier games in the series does a great job of making you feel like you're on a road trip with a lot of characters and you're bringing them in as the situation requires. Mm -hmm. Also quickly mention, I played through Pepper Grinder just because I like to always highlight indies if I get the chance. Fantastic game. It's like, it's like a elevator pitch for it. It's like the best type of Game Boy Advance game. Like it has that type Ooh. of feel, like bite size, solid, very, very snappy gameplay. It's a very short game. I, I, I think it's my jam. Um, as for me, I uh, tomorrow is a big day, um, Persona 3 Reload Day. So uh, listeners of this podcast may recall that a couple of years ago, I tried to do a Persona 3 day-by-day -day playthrough, and I failed. And the reason that I failed <laughs> was that I uh, went on a... Uh, a two week trip to the British Virgin Islands where I was sailing around and I didn't bring my Vita because I didn't want to have any electronics on me mm -hmm. at that time. And as a result, I got 
far enough behind in Persona 3 Portable that I just didn't pick it up again. But I've had Persona 3 Reload sitting on my Steam Deck for a few months now. And this is it. This is time. Tomorrow I'm going to pick it up and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start playing through with it. And I don't know if I'll do it by day by day, but at least I'm going to try and keep it week by week. And I figure that maybe at this point, if I, if I stay on it, maybe eventually... I will actually finish it, and I will. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, justice. We're uh, time is a flat circle. We're returning back to the beginning. We're doing the Persona Three <laughs> reload return. day by day, once again. <laughs> and this time, I may even make it to June. We'll see. But before I do that, um, so I'm going to New York in uh, in about a week. And so I'm really feeling the pressure, interestingly enough, to finish Unicorn Overlord because I don't want to bring my Switch and my uh, and my Steam Deck. I kind of mm. want to be able to like just pick one and bring them with me. Though actually, when I come come to think of it, I do have to bring my Switch with me because I'm going to be playing um, I'm going to be playing Stardew Valley with Amy. So scratch that. But I do want to get through. I want to get through Unicorn Overlord so I can play through other things. The problem is, and I was talking about this in the pre-show. I keep getting into these loops where I'm tinkering with my teams, and then I have to like go into mock battles and be like, okay, but is, how does this team work together? Um, I just expanded a team uh, to five characters that has like, not Fran, uh, the other Griffin Rider. I forget what her name is, and oh. also goth girl with the shield and the axe and uh elf girl with one of the, the twin bows one of them mm -hmm. and what else um i'm like i'm trying to oh the elven uh fencer and it's a very it's a very offensive oriented team and so they can just do follow-up attacks again and again and again so the uh, goth girl with the shield and the axe can um, initially debuff everybody. She is so And busted. then they- It's messed up. Yeah, she's ridiculously good. And then they just come in and start, start attacking and attacking and attacking and the elven fencer uses the rock thing. And I'm like, okay, how can I be additive to this team? And I, and I tried a lot of different options. Actually, one of them that's been really good for me is um, box girl. Sexy fox girl. <laughs> At a certain point, the furries show up in this game. At a certain point, the furries appear. <laughs> the furries show up, just like so many RPGs recently. Um, but I picked the boring option and just put an elven archer in there. And because I wanted um, uh, to be able to, uh, I, I wanted to support unit uh, and a little bit more healing. So um, probably, though, I should be going with hyper offense, but. Uh, in my mindset, I can't go hyper offense. I don't know, but I'm in the uh, I'm in the snow area at this point in Unicorn Overload, so I don't know how close I am to actually being done. But I'm making progress at least. You're close to the end. I would say you're maybe like ten hours away if you're like, or maybe like ten to fifteen, because like there's one more major region after where you are, and then it's just like go do the final battle. Uh, yeah, and that last region you do is pretty small compared to the other ones. So like you're, you're kind of nearing the end game, I would say. Uh, also the point where you have to start thinking about who you going to romance uh, because that, Oh yeah. I've, I'm trying to do that. As soon as I discovered that aspect of it, I, I knew exactly who I was going to romance. So I went and just did the, just gave her a billion gifts and got her rapport up. Who, uh, who all the way up. Picking? Who are you picking, Cat? A uh, Crusader girl uh, with the shield and the sword. You know who I'm talking about? Wait, the the knight, like like Monica, right? She has like the blonde hair and she's got like the shield and and the sword. Yeah, yeah. It, it, does she have the helmet or no helmet? No helmet. No helmet. And and it, a okay. radiant a radiant knight. No, 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 not her, not her. Um, okay. You you would know who I'm talking about if you if you saw her. She's a crusader. Okay, cuz there's two there are two like knight characters I'm thinking of. And one of them totally get it. Other other one is like 
canonically formerly involved with and still maybe has feelings for one of Elaine's best bros. And I was like, Cat, you can't do that to Clive. You can't do that. You can't. Is oh. her name Valkyria? Is that or no? no. That's uh, that's her ability to move up. Why can't I find this character's name? Anyway, I'm just gonna post a picture in the Discord, and you'll instantly know who I'm yeah, gonna yeah, who yeah. I'm talking put a, put a about. In the Discord. There's a good reason to be a star of Destiny, oh, so that you don't oh have to God, listen to us. No, cat. Mm. Yes, cat. Yes, cat. Cat. yes. <laughs> That's yes. your cousin. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not though if cats is a cat. No. Why does she have to be my cousin? I hate this. <laughs> I was oh so worried. God. I was like, "Oh no, you're going to steal your best friend's girl and it's so much worse." <laughs> <laughs> Why would you do this to me, Eric? Uh, this bliss. Oh my god. Uh, okay, <laughs> I thank guess you. I have to find thank somebody you, new. Boop. Thank you, Super Boop. <laughs> Her? <laughs> Is she funny or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I almost oh, no. wish I had let that happen, but I, I can't. I can't in good conscience <laughs> just let that fly by. <laughs> What's her name exactly? Anne. Uh it's it's Virginia, right? Virginia. Yeah. Virginia's off limits. Not not Alabama, surprisingly. Virginia. Um, uh Virginia. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Oh. <laughs> I wish Naughty over here. That'd be oh. a great <laughs> Oh, oh Nadia no, would have had a field day with this. <laughs> she would have died. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Eric, what have you been playing? <laughs> oh, God. How do I follow this? Okay. Um, I'm going to see if this works on the tech end. Um, we're going to try this. Um, yeah, this does work. Okay. So I've been playing this game. It's called Content Warning. And I've got video of it on the live stream from our runs. Uh, Content Warning is a fascinating game. It came out on April 1st, and they had it available for free uh, for, like, one day, and then it went up to $8. And the whole idea of Content Warning is that you are different, uh, like, like guys in diver suits, um, and, and you're, you're in the above world, but you want to make content. And so you got to get in the submersible and submerge down to the below to the to the deep below and make content by like filming things down there and and all it really tells you is like film something spooky and when you get down there it's like all these weird like like it looks like sketch drawings like black and white it's super creepy and you have basically a camera and flashlights and you film what is essentially like a bad youtube ghost hunting thing while all these monsters are trying to murder you and your friends and it is honestly one of the most entertaining, funny games I have played in a long time. Um, it is, it, it, it's like Lethal Company. So like Lethal Company got really, really big where it was like, okay, here's this um, game where you kind of run around and you're in co-op and you're trying to just like get stuff and bring it back and extract it with your friends, right? Uh, I think what, lethal company missed was this element of content creation honestly like being able to look at the video afterwards that you've recorded and laugh at it together is such an effective way of closing that loop and bringing it around where you now want to bring the the content back where you want to like watch these funny videos with your friends um friend of the show jesse vitelli i was playing it with him uh ken was in there um i don't think we've had moises on we should have moises on at some point moises was also playing with us uh where like they have posted a lot of our videos, our runs on their Twitters if you want to go watch them. But like it is an incredibly fun co-op horror game where you are just doing the silliest things where you are. There's this 
weird wobbling snail man who's trying to like chase after you and grab you and like suck the life out of you and we're running around with flashlights being like yo snail man snail man what's up how's it go we're, we're, we're the content boys <laughs> and we have like reporter mics that we have bought with money and we're holding it up to them and being like snail man what do you think about the current happenings in the political climate and we're like just goofing it's like <laughs> such a good engine for goofs um i would not be surprised if this becomes a game that we play during the blood god charity stream because i would love mm. to see how you and nadia <laughs> react to this video game um, oh my gosh yeah. Yeah. I've heard it, of this game, but I I don't I don't feel like I really understand how it works exactly. Yeah, it it basically you just go down, you film stuff, you come back up, you upload your video and then you get views based on like what happened, like did you film cool monsters, did you film stuff? Like it's kind of I don't understand the scoring system fully. I feel like it's supposed to be very vague so that way you're kind of encouraged to just go film things, but that is really it. Is you just go film your like bad youtube videos of ghost hunting while these things like try to murder you because like all to be clear there's like monsters down here in this deep below and they are like one of them is an egg beater man that has like no arms but is like really tall and lanky and then has like an egg beater for for a face that just like runs at you and like whirs the whole time and can like if it hits you it just like knocks you out completely there was a guy we call tomberry man because it was just a tiny little like dude in like uh, a bad children's ghost costume, like the like a bed sheet with eyes drawn on it, and he had a knife and he was just stabbing us. There was <laughs> there was one that was like an Iron Maiden that only moved when you weren't looking at it, and when it caught one of uh, I think it caught Jesse, uh, it basically popped out a captcha for us to enter, and if we didn't enter the captcha right, it murders whoever is in the Iron Maiden, and we entered it wrong, and Jesse got murdered. So. Uh, we it, it part of it's about like how fun and weird the monsters are and how you sometimes don't know what to expect or what they're going to do and things like that but it's also about like having the camera in game and like filming it so you're doing the whole like oh my god oh my god like it's a little Blair Witch but also a little bit what was that web series that was like what up ghosts it's your boy like that sort of thing where it's almost mm -hmm. like um having fun with the whole thing and it's really, really good for just a group of people to go make these stupid, dumb videos and then surface back up to the top and watch them and upload them and, and get views and then laugh together and then do it all over again. Because there's all different kinds of areas that you can go to. Um, different monsters can show up. Obviously, um, there are different items you can get. And all the items are very like based around making content so you can get like party poppers and a boom mic and a reporter mic and a clapper and i had a sound player that could do like laugh tracks and stuff so when the guy was trying to stab us <laughs> i was playing the sad like wah, 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 over and over again when people died like it is like the goofiest funniest game uh and i i'm like this is doing for me like I lethal company was a game I respected from a distance. I was like, I get why people like this, but it felt too much like work. It felt too much like a game. I get that was the point that it was supposed to be like, Oh, you want to like extract with stuff and get it out and get cash and then go back in and keep going for more runs. But it was very like gamey in that way where it was like, Oh, you know, if you have a run go bad in lethal company, you like lose all the equipment that you've built up and uh, you don't really know what to do at this point. And like, yeah, it can be funny, but I feel like content warning better zeroes in on just making it engaging and funny from the get go and focusing that as its like core center. Oh my God. Sorry. Focusing that as its core center rather than trying to like turn it into an extraction shooter, trying to turn it into a video game. I think content warning works super, super well in that regard. So it is honestly one of the biggest surprises for me of the year. Um, and it's a game that I constantly want to play. I'm like thinking about playing it tonight, uh, honestly. Oh. So, uh, yeah, check it out. It's like eight bucks on, on Steam too. Yeah. Like they, it was free for April they Fool's did. Day, but then they like put it out yeah. for purchase and it's like eight bucks. It's like nothing. That um, was an interesting little. Uh, a little tactic to try and get attention was to just put it out for free for 24 hours. And a lot of people, but a lot of people picked it up. Concurrence were very high for a bit. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, I don't know how much money they lost in sales, but in terms of getting people's attention on it kind of worked. Right. Yeah. I think, I think this is a game that honestly, like 
probably would have had a lot of trouble getting traction otherwise. Not because it's bad or anything. It's not like a statement on the quality, but like co-op horror is like a very trendy genre right now, whether that's asymmetrical or whether it is like people trying to do lethal company likes. And I even Phasmo and stuff like that, like that, that has become its entire genre unto itself. And so I, I look at, um, content warning and the way they released that it didn't just work to like generate, you know, word of mouth and things like that, but they probably got a lot of sales after people, you know, got it. They were like, Oh, free game. Sure. I'll get that. I did that. Uh, and then they played it and they're like, Oh no, this game is actually really, really good. Uh, you know, they, they have the night where they're like, why don't we all try that game we picked up for free? And they realize like, Oh, this is actually really good. And we should get other people to play it. And now it's spreading in a different way. So I don't think that works for everybody, but for a game like this, that is co-op, that is group play focus, that is streamer, like, like streamers will love this game. Um, like watching people play this game is as fun as playing the game itself. Uh, I, I, I see this doing very well. And, and, and again, I, I think this is what I wanted from Lethal Company and did not fully get from Lethal Company. Um, other than that, I'm just bouncing around stuff. I'm waiting for like a couple games to come out this month. Like Aiden is, is coming out this month. I'm really looking forward to that. So I'm kind of trying to keep my schedule open for whenever I'm able to play that game. Um, I wanted to play the Saga Emerald Beyond demo before this episode. I just didn't get around to it, but... It really feels like we're in an era of tons of RPGs coming out to play. Like, like we really have yeah. no shortage of good RPGs to talk about. So, very much so. Okay, that's it for the tavern. Normally, I would say Nadia, take us home. But as I already mentioned, Nadia is out getting cigarettes. So instead, it's another round of industry story time with Cat. And I'm wondering, what was everybody's first review brendan do you do you do game reviews out of curiosity sorry for my uh, ignorance on this one no it, we do we do um my first review um the first review that i got a code for mm -hmm. i don't know um no there i should know this i'm actually embarrassed that i don't know this because it was having definitely it, <laughs> it, it was definitely an indie game and it's probably a game that i was super excited to get a code for. Uh, I don't know. It definitely wasn't, but I'll just say it was the messenger. But there was definitely stuff before. Really? That, but uh, the messenger was was one of my favorite, like bigger games to me. Bigger game that I was was able to review ahead of time. Um, and. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm like so embarrassed now because I feel like I should remember the first <laughs> Put you on the I spot. Reviewed. I know. Um, I will say I am very thankful and happy that as of late, the last few years, I've been able to get a lot of, I think, higher profile review codes to review and, and make content around, including Rebirth and Infinite Wealth. Um, nice. So mm -hmm. we've we've come a long way from very small indie game reviews and uh, messenger is a very small indie game, but we've come a long way. Um, no doubt. <laughs> um, the messenger, I actually reviewed the messenger and I, if I recall correctly, I gave it a perfect score at the it time. Deserves it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought it was very clever. I thought it was a really clever rendition of the eight bit kind of Ninja Gaiden like mm -hmm. initially. And then, uh, transitioning into more of the Sega Genesis 16-bit contiguous world that's also a little bit of a Metroidvania. Mm -hmm. It doesn't entirely stick the landing, but it comes close. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it at the time. Yeah, I, I I love that game. That was for me when I when I discovered The Messenger for the first time, it was on the show floor at PAX East. I don't know. It must have been... I think The Messenger was 2018. So this must have been mm -hmm. 2016 maybe or 2017. But whenever I first discovered it at PAX East, I had the good fortune of like sitting down with uh, Thierry Bullinger, who's the like the creative director at Sabotage Studio, um, and we played the game together. And like we played the PAX East demo, whatever they were showing, but we had such a great conversation, and we're talking about it. And they were basically like, "Listen, I can I can show you some other stuff that's not part of the demo. We can like kind of go into it." 
He's like, but it will it will spoil stuff for you, sort of. And I was like, I I don't care. I want to see more of this game because for me it was like when I had first played that game, I was like, oh, this this is hitting me on a very grander scale. Like th this feels like it could be like a shovel knight level of indie game, very impactful, very memorable. And uh it, it was for me after that and after playing the full game. And I love Sea of Stars. I like everything they do. <laughs> so how about you, Eric? I like, yeah, depending on how we phrase this question, because I mean, the first game I probably ever critically talked about in front of like an audience would be going all the way back to like college. And we had a like student review show at the college where we just talk about games that had come out. Uh, most of those videos are now scrubbed from the internet because of reasons. And um, thank God for that. <laughs> uh, some of them, yeah, because one of them I was definitely like, I did not like Bravely Default at the time, and I railed against Bravely Default for a while. So shout outs to not having that on record. Um, and I did the same. You for like Columbia. it now? No, but I don't I don't need to revisit my critical capability. That, that's part of like the, the part of all this is that like, I think I'm a very different critic now than I was you know, however many years ago that was at this point. And uh, while my sentiments might not have changed, I think definitely the way I express those sentiments has changed. And so that is, that's more of what's painful about going back to some of my old reviews is I see like, I was looking at my profile um, on, on like, you know, the different sites that kind of aggregate your, your writing and stuff. Cause there's a billion of them now. Um, and I saw some old reviews. Some of them I was like, yeah, no, I'd, I'd probably still feel okay about that. And other ones where I was like, what the hell was I thinking? What was I, what was <laughs> I doing back then that I loved Gauntlet so much? But uh, I think the one that sticks out in my mind was the moment where I felt like I got my first opportunity was I, <laughs> number one, I did the PC port of Rise Son of Rome. Uh and I don't know why, but like that one sticks out because I tried doing like all of the content around it. So I, I did like a video review and like a hands on impressions and like a full review and all that. I treated it like it was like a big IGN to do. And uh, I <laughs> I think I played through that game like twice and I deeply dislike Rise Son of Rome now. <laughs> um that game does not hold up to scrutiny. Uh I think I gave it like a 60 or something. Um it was the Xbox One release. Yeah, it was <laughs> look, that game was definitely an early Xbox One game. Uh but the other game I specifically remember was the first time I did like a big AAA review where I did like the review event and all that. And so I did the one for Call of Duty Advanced Warfare. And uh, that was certainly an experience. They don't really do that kind of stuff anymore. Uh, it was, they, they basically just locked us in, not locked, but like put us in rooms and had us playing the game for like two or three days straight. Uh, and then we yeah had... don't miss those <laughs> yeah that's that sucked like you know the food was all right but like <laughs> it was it was like we're just gonna like sit here and, and play a video game because they want to be like so controlling of like the environment in which the call of duty gets played and, and i do not miss those whatsoever um but yeah for god so many reviews over the years but those are the two that always jump out at me when i think of like my first reviews in terms of like the, the first game I really felt like I got a code for this. I'm going to play this and I'm going to cover it. And then like uh, the first time I felt like I was doing like a big review thing. And I was like, oh, I'm la da da. I'm at the, the industry events. I'm an industry professional. I was not. I was not industry <laughs> nor professional. <laughs> <laughs> I, it makes me think of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I was going to say I scrolled through and I was not far off. Uh, same year dead cells was the first like kind of oh. larger game i got a review code for but the messenger was right after so yeah eric uh, you talking about review events makes me think of some of the very random reviews i've done over the years like mm -hmm. i did the call of duty advanced warfare review for uh for a u.s gamer in like 20 2014 2015 a, a game that uh Wait, i really did, did not know yeah, yeah. Did you do the review event for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we were both there. Really? <laughs> yeah, because I was at that. Oh. That that was my first event. That. Okay, that's weird. Wow. 
that huh. is weird. <laughs> Activision basically, Activision basically locked me in a room. Yep. <laughs> and I played uh, the Call of Duty Advanced Warfare uh, <laughs> campaign <laughs> for X amount of time, and um, I thought it was pretty. It, what's the Kevin Spacey in that one? Yeah, that's the Kevin um, Spacey one, which is you know aged like fine wine, you know. <laughs> Really and I came out, and that's the one where that has the press F to pay respects. That was the yes. origin of that meme. Yeah, but I so I dumb. did like that game ultimately. Like I thought it, it had some right. neat ideas. I I like the weird thing they were doing with like the you could get guns that had different properties. Like you got gun drops. Basically, I thought that was novel. I thought it was interesting. But um, I did my I did the best I could, but I really did not know what the hell I was talking about when I reviewed that game. Uh, I was like, ah, it's a Call of Duty game, you know, and a lot of Call of Duty fans who were super invested in the series came out and said, yeah, this is like the kind of the refresh that the series has been waiting for. And it really has much better uh, movement abilities and everything. And then yeah. Call of Duty fans sort of hated the movement abilities after a time. And like, we don't actually like that anymore. It's the COD um, cycle. But at the time, but I kind of gave it a more of a middling review, and then Activision never uh, let us review a Call of Duty again. <laughs> <laughs> Lol. Incredible, incredible. Uh, I also reviewed Halo Four. Really? <laughs> yeah, me noted you, Halo fan, Cat Bailey. Keep ending up with these games. <laughs> I don't know. I there was a period of time where Parrish thought I was a big Halo fan. And so he kept giving me Halo stuff to do, like uh, the Halo <laughs> Master Chief collection. And I, you know, at the time, especially at the time, I needed the work. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. I don't care. But, uh, but then he gets it in his head. He's like, you love Halo. You reviewed yeah, Halo. Yeah, you love Halo. <laughs> <laughs> There have been multiple times where he's invited me on to Halo retrospectives on Retronauts, and I've been like, uh, Parrish, I don't actually like Halo. He's like, but, y but you, you reviewed, reviewed it. it. <laughs> I was like, you assigned me the review, man. <laughs> <laughs> and the Halo 4 review event was weird because there were all these Halo 4 super fans in there who, mm. you know, a lot of them I love and respect, and they're great people. But, but it's just a different corner of gaming that I don't necessarily understand. I'm over here in my fighting game, RPG, Japanese games, nerd face. And they're over here in the broski Halo fear. And they're like, yeah, you know, when I was growing up and I was in the dorms and I was playing, uh, playing Halo 4 split screen co or Halo 2 split screen co-op with the boys. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that I totally relate to that. Um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I did the best I could. It was a fun, it was a fun game. I didn't, uh, I, I started to sort of understand why it grabbed, grabbed people at the time. But uh, the first ever review I ever did was a uh, super robot wars, endless frontier mm -hmm. for the Nintendo DS, that lines a up, game. Yeah. Uh, that at the time was notable for being one of the handful of Western localized releases in the U.S., even though it wasn't, strictly speaking, a Super Robot Wars tactics game. And um, I didn't really like it, actually, because it's a fairly traditional uh, top-down RPG mixed with battles that actually look really great. It's a little bit of a Project Cross Zone kind of vibe mm. in that you have the characters and then you're doing the little moves and it's all about inputs <clears throat> to bring it full circle with the fighting game conversation. So you're just doing the inputs and then you're getting super moves and you're doing combos. The problem was uh, you just kept doing those inputs over and over and over again. And the boss battles started to get uh, quite repetitive after a while. And the story was really kind of nothing. So I I became very checked out on it but and gave it, a I, as I recall, a fairly middling review but getting getting that special nintendo ds review carts were different from typical review carts because they were much bigger it was it was a little weird like you would have to uh so they stick out from your ds uh but you know they can play just fine and everything 
And um, so getting that weird cart for the first time and sticking it into my DS, I knew that I had arrived. Thank you, Jeremy Parrish. But that's it for this week's episode of Acts of the Blood God. Thank you so much for listening. And yeah, we had a lot of good times um, in this one. Um, <laughs> thanks for very much appreciated. Thank you, Brendan, for coming on the show. Uh, why don't you promote some things? Uh, sure. Um, I run past the controller. We do. We have a weekly show. Uh, we stream occasionally. I do written stuff as well over at our website, pastthecontroller.io. And one of the, I think when I was on for Sea of Stars, we, we had talked about it then too, but one of the things I've been doing a lot more of, even from that point to now, is um, I sort of take games, usually games that are current or games that are just coming out, and I make a cocktail to pair with it. Um, and that's kind of turned into a much bigger thing of what I do. Uh, we just were at PAX East last month, and... We had a panel there with an amazing cast of panelists. A lot of friends of the show for for Blood God were were on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Hyam has Kate been on here before? Uh, I don't. Or Jenny. I don't think we've had Kate or Jenny on this show. Okay, I'm trying to um, think, but I don't think we have. But and then you know Jesse and, and Ken were were on there. It was it was a great time. They all gave me different games that they love for a different reason, and if they wanted to give me any sort of flavor or alcohol preference. I took those ideas and created cocktails with those games in mind, but also those people in mind. Um, and it was, I think it went really well. It was a pretty packed room and people were pretty excited. We gave out recipe cards at the end and people like, there's pictures. I'm like still shocked. Someone asked me to sign the recipe card. I don't know why, I don't know. Um, but it, it was it was really fun, really cool. I'm working on some other bigger things with, with that. Um, more later on those things, but I've been enjoying doing that. I mean, I, I worked in the service industry for a long time uh, prior to this, so I like being able to kind of pull that from my roots and uh, just make delicious drinks for people that want to oh. enjoy delicious drinks. So I've been doing that, and it's been doing really well. So if you're interested in those things, you can find them on our website over on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter and find those things, and uh, yeah. If you make the drink, share it, because I like to see people actually enjoying them. And as always, we uh, you can support us over on the Patreon at patreon.com slash bloodgodpod. This week, we are joined, as always, by the stars of Destiny, um, including Anthrax Bees, Zixa, uh, Criminal Justice, who is one of our mods, Flashback 2012, Harvest Lunatic, JB, and Cal L. We're going to be handing over into the post show in just a moment where I'm sure there will be plenty more hijinks, uh, some legendary, legendary content. Um, I'm sorry that you missed out on it, Nadia. So maybe we'll have some more fun over in the post show in just a hot moment. And as always, please follow us on our social platforms. Remember that we uh, record this live every Saturday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern on Twitch at tw twitch.tv slash bloodgodpod please like and subscribe over there. And we're on YouTube as well if you did not catch the live stream. And that's over at uh, Acts of the Blood God on YouTube. We'll be back, as always, to talk more about the genre we love. We, we should have the whole gang back next week after a little bit of rotation. So that'll be a so. lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. But until then, for Eric Nad <laughs> Sorry, Nadia, for Eric Brendan, uh, Mitchell and myself, thanks for listening and happy adventuring. <laughs>